here, uh, who is Jane uh, Lilso. Uh, she uh, once uh, had a come and then gave us a talk, which I really enjoyed. And uh, she lived in Ni Niigata, uh, the, the Japanese sort of, um, I wouldn't call it a peripheral, but it, it's quite far away from both Tokyo and Kyoto, but mountainside. Uh, and uh, I used to go there uh, for skiing a lot. Uh, she lived there for two and a half years and um, kind of sort of exposed herself into the, the Japanese uh, nature and uh, local people. Um, when I talk about nature, uh, especially with my, my husband, my husband occasionally say, Japan is such a hostile country. I said, what do you mean by hostile? And uh, he keeps saying, especially after the, the um, uh, March 11, uh, a disaster, but maybe thanks to the, the climate change uh, we are experiencing in Japan and maybe elsewhere in the world uh, quite extreme uh, climate. So Japan has been experiencing um, torrential rain and uh, flooding, uh, volcano eruption, uh, obviously tsunami, uh, earthquake and all sorts of things and then every time we see the Japanese news on, on telly and then see those, you know, the, the power of nature uh, on the news. My husband keeps saying, uh, Shihoko, are you sure we are going back to Japan in the future? Japan looks so hostile or something like that. Well, nature can be hostile, but uh, nature can be also very much embracing. And uh, I was really surprised uh, when, whenever I talk to the, the people from Tohoku area. Uh, I mean, Niigata is on the other side of the, the Japanese archipelago, the, the spine of Japan. Niigata is this side and then the disaster area was on this side. But uh, it is quite harsh nature there. And uh, especially the disaster hit the people. Uh, but then, if you talk to those people, they don't hate the power of nature, even after the disaster. And when we organized this, um, exhibition uh, here at Daiwa, we had this uh, um, Gentle Heart Project uh, exhibition, which was a collection of handkerchiefs designed by uh, children of the disaster area. And uh, we had uh, two or three visits by the local uh, pri primary school here in London. And those children, about six, seven, eight years of age, they come came here and then said, uh, uh, Miss, why are there so many uh, pictures or, or design of the sea and fish? And I realized, yes, after the tsunami and uh, you know the, the sea destroyed the whole thing and then maybe even killed uh, their family members, why children still come up with those pictures with beautiful blue, blue sea and fish looking really sort of happily swimming in there? So even after the disaster, for the children, the sea, the nature, is still their, their friends. So, um, you know, nature is uh, very much embedded in Japanese culture and in our minds. And maybe Joseph, uh, Jane, can um, explain that much better than I can. So let's uh, listen to what uh, she can tell us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what shall I? Shall I hit the return button to move it on? Yeah. Right, as always, um, complete technophobes, of course. Um, thank you ever so much for coming out, um, particularly on a Friday evening. Thank you, but there's still time for um, drinking and fun afterwards. Not that this won't be fun. <laughs> My not be. <laughs> yeah, I lived, um, I lived for two and a half years, um, the first time in Japan, in the snowy mountains of Niigata. And then I returned to study here a little longer. And the second time I lived in Japan, I lived nearly three years in Tokyo. So that was quite a different, quite
quite a different experience. Um, and I have to say that the countryside experience was um, far greater and far deeper and richer. Sorry, Tokyo. Okay. Um, Takeo Doi was a renowned Japanese academic and psychoanalyst and an explanation of the close relationship between Japan's people and nature seems to hold, for me at least, the greatest clarity. I mean, it's easy to feel that Japan um, can have a, shouldn't have a monopoly on this idea of the super close relationship and understanding of nature. And the British are perhaps an almost cliched nation um, for their frequent references to nature in everyday small talk, constantly noting even the most minor changes in weather, the strength, frequency, and the quality of rain, perhaps. But what Japan has not relied upon historically to the extent of many other people and cultures is religion. And what Takeo Doi points out is that where many people draw comfort and salvation from a god, Japan, largely lacking this historically, has been a societal um, has seen a societal and cultural evolution in the form of a more whole and fully immersive relationship with nature, with the human seeking a sustained, rich and lifelong relationship with the natural world in place of God or a God. In the West, through the 18th century, we saw the uh, Romantic movement. And though this movement came close to the Japanese experience of nature, Takeo Doi felt that this never fully reached the deep immersive state of the Japanese, as there was the continual presence of ego that somehow always placed itself in opposition to nature. So with this in mind, with the idea of nature in all its forms, as the food we eat, the air we breathe, all that grows, with the force of the seasons, the elements in all their horror and beauty, uh, I want to talk about my own observations and writing on Japan. And I think that this view of nature as being equal to the position of other nations' gods and belief systems is that which as that which nourishes, comforts, and indeed relates to and explains our existence, is a really good explanation of how deeply the Japanese feel about nature. After I'd written my falling down house, I came across the work of a prolific young painter, Tetsuya Ishida, and we're going to look at we're going to look at his work. Um, he's a long-term depression sufferer. He passed away in 2005 at the age of just 31, having been hit by a train. Um, it's generally accepted that this was an accident, but I truly can't see that this wasn't suicide. Um, but what he left to the world is a phenomenal collection of surreal artworks that depict everyday Japanese life, Japanese identity, and ordinary people's real struggle to deal with modern work environments. And there are several paintings of his that I have experienced real shivers in viewing, naturally for his uh, skill and imagination, but also because I felt, I felt him as a kind of kindred spirit. Um, as though long before I started writing, he painted some of the images that I had in my head. Okay, so this first painting is, is complicated and troubling. You see a young guy crouched in a petrified state on a desk, at home perhaps, or at college or work, I, I can't quite tell. And he wears a grassy blanket to comfort himself. But is it comforting him or is it weighing him down? There's a house, 
and his former self as a young boy looking down at him from the hill. <clears throat> Not as clear as I'd like, sorry. Is this former self standing in judgment of him? Or is the young self calling him back home, perhaps back to the countryside and away from his current urban distress? Well, we can't answer all of this, but what seems clear is that Ishida wants us to explore Japanese identity, and he often uses nature as a metaphor. Perhaps in a Western painting, a similar story might be told by placing an angel on his shoulder. Or bright light might be used, implying that God above was watching over him. But in place of that, we have a cosy looking blanket of grass and trees to comfort him. <clears throat> in this next picture, we see a young couple and perhaps assume they're in a relationship now facing difficulties and so turned away from one another. Well, there's nothing unique about that as an experience, but what's interesting is that the artist places them outside the house and lays them in the environment. There's a rescue dinghy with two men in it. The ground appears shaken up, implying that there has been an earthquake and flooding, perhaps a result of a tsunami. It's hard to know whether the natural disaster has split the couple apart or whether the two states of the emotional quake, so to speak, and the natural disaster just happened to present themselves at the same time. Or whether nature is in fact mirroring the relationships. What is particularly unsettling about this image are the faces emerging from the ground. Can you make those out? Mm -hmm. and who, who those faces represent. Perhaps, uh, perhaps those who've been lost in the disaster, perhaps ancestors, but they emerge as they're grown out of the soil or as though they're pushed up from it. Here is, here we see two salarymen and a woman almost drowning. You have the sense that the waters will soon take them completely, and yet despite the presence of the water, it seems clear that that isn't the problem. And though they are, offer up vast piles of money, presumably seeking help, we're left with the impression that the money isn't going to save them. And here is Ishida's Kafkaesque portrayal of the contemporary young male. While he's pictured in a modern dwelling, and while he clearly has a bottle suggesting alcohol, he lies there naked, returned to a natural state, and he seeks comfort in a beetle shell. Okay, now this final image that I want to share with you is perhaps the most disturbing, with a young man rendered in all ways impotent by modern life, with the road and rail lines travelling through him, dismembering him even, and suggesting his complete surrender in life, um, a life in which he has few genuine choices, for he must take a job for life, he must work long hours, perhaps into the weekends also, attending obligatory heavy drinking sessions with his boss and co-workers, all, all those familiar stories that we remember emerging from the 80s. That there are trees starting to grow out of him suggests what? That he also seeks comfort from nature, 
or that things are already much worse, much further along, that he's passing away, transforming once more, and returning to nature through his death. I don't know if any of you have read My Falling Down House so far, but if any of you have, a few of the images might slightly resonate. And if you look online for his work, it, you'll be amazed that by 31 he'd really made quite as much as he did. <coughs> so I want to talk you through a few photographic images now that I hope suggest my own version of Japan and share some of the Im Im uh, images that influence the novel. And then I'd like to read a couple of brief excerpts to you from the novel. So I developed a bit of an obsession with bamboo, as you do. Um, and my very good friends in Japan took me to a bamboo farm where they make, uh, they grow rather, a hundred varieties of bamboo. Um, that's quite an astonishing place to walk through. Another element of Japanese culture and nature that I just want to mention very, very briefly um, is food. Um, I pick up in the novel on the idea that Traditionally, the Japanese believe you should re eat 30 ingredients in a day, sanju himoku. And um, it always makes me laugh in British culture when the government promotes the idea that we should eat five or seven <laughs> fruit and veg. And I think, okay, Japanese breakfast probably contains 12. Um, okay. Um, and as much as, as we're against in the West using um, certain kinds of large fish, um, this is a, a piece of fresh wasabi um, being grated. And the little paddle grater, which has the most fantastic surface, is shark skin. But it's really durable, so you have one of those and it lasts you forever, <coughs> much as it would last a shark forever. Okay, early autumn pomegranates. So just the idea that you get intense colours, intense warmth. Autumn. And these are all taken up in the north of Japan where I used to live. And I go back there as often as I can, at least once a year. Um, this I took in my own town. I call it my town, naturally. Um, this is taken in Tokamachi. The grandpa there is still wearing a traditional um, straw hat. They're either straw or bamboo. Um, these feature heavily in the novel, are deconstructed and made into other things. Um, but can you get a sense of um, the height of that snow? Mm -hmm. This is another good image to show you that. So this is, this is the main shopping street, which is entirely full. So they get between three and five metres of snow for up to five months of the year. I cried. Uh, okay, that's from my home, and you add these, it's from inside, so you add these slats of wood to shore up your home against the weight, the weight of the snow. And it, you dig away, and people help you on a daily basis, and every morning you wake up and you're snow blind again. But it is incredibly beautiful. And having that much snow, of course, once a year they have a massive snow festival. There's a famous one, I think, in Sapporo and another one in Hokkaido. Um, but there's this huge one in 
um, Tokamachi, and every year they build a snow garden, they sculpt a snow garden. And so that isn't actually a bridge, it's ice. And, um, and that's me trying very hard not to slip. And, um, and they build uh, a tea room and serve tea to tourists. I was never a tourist. Uh, the other thing that you have to enjoy in Japan in the winter times, of course, are the hot springs. Um, and that's, that's what saves you in winter time, particularly in the mountains. Um, being outside in extremely hot water on the side of a mountain and enjoying that view. And this, a quite sweet image. Um, I could say cliche, but I'm going to say classical image of young girls dressing up in quite a frivolous, quite an informal way to wear kimono, to be honest, um, because most of them are wearing modern boots. And they stopped me to ask me to take pictures of them. They had to um, encourage them to put their iPhones away. <laughs> They've still got the boots and the bag in the background. Um, but we're all familiar with the idea of the picnics, the picnics under the cherry blossom. And Japan enjoys, enjoys its festivals and celebrations throughout all the seasons absolutely constantly, much more frequently um, than I've noticed anywhere else. Okay, I'm going to just read you a couple of brief pieces. Okay, early on in the novel, um, the young man that's just arrived in a dilapidated uh, Japanese house, a traditional house, um, he's in a state, quite a distraught state. So if you think back to the images um, I showed you in the paintings, he's certainly one of those distraught young men who's starting to unravel. And he arrives in this traditional Japanese house uh, thinking that he'll settle himself there overnight. Even without food, I would be fine in a few more days. I had come here because I was drawn to the place. There was a feel for nature here, a sense of a slow and simple way of living, a forgotten way of living. There was nothing here to harm me, earth, wood, sand and stone, and tatami beneath my feet. And now I had my cello. This house was on my side. And just in that brief part, I just wanted to suggest the idea of animating the house as well as nature. And because it's made out of natural materials, I wanted him to feel at one, both with nature and with the dwelling he was in. Much further on in the novel, um, when he has unraveled quite significantly, he spends a lot of his time naked. He's 25. By this time, he's quite undernourished. He's lost all his body hair and the hair on his head. And he's almost out of food. Um, and in a hallucinatory state, he concocts the idea that if he tries to come as close as he can to nature, and in a sense makes makes of himself a plant or a vegetable, he might manage to gain nourishment from the earth. So the idea he has is that he's going to do a prolonged headstand in the ground and seek nourishment from the soil. So at this point, he's managed to do that and he's sustained it for quite a long time but he's worried about getting back to his dwelling unseen. He's also dug, he dug a little hole 
in which he completed his headstand. I do not know how I managed to remain so still so long, but finally the walker has moved away. I dare not peer out, but I know full well it is possible I was seen, naive to think otherwise, and yet if I was seen, why did the walker not challenge me? Why didn't they come closer, speak, even kick at the stone-like figure to see what I was about, what business I had here? I cannot work it through, and I have to get back to my house, which I, fool man, left completely unattended. But I had better fill this hole, cover it back over, leave no trace. I scratch at the ground and battle this intractable sense of urgency to get home as soon as I can. I have to check the house over immediately, that no one has come there, that no one lies in wait. And what of the shapeshifter? Was it here just now? It can't have been. Surely it can't, or it risks discovery every bit as much as myself. And it lacked my specific purpose here, so for sure, for sure, it can't have been. The walker here tonight was certainly human. I know this by the tread, and I do not truly believe the intruder that enters my place is human. It's possible that the shapeshifter took human form while it ventured here. It would rather take some animal form, a raccoon dog, or a palm civet, allowing it to move about the gardens with ease. No, the walker here was not my intruder. Of that I feel certain. I realise now that the most likely candidate is the light-footed menace. That stupid monk. Is it possible, was it him? In this instance, the tread was anything but light, and since I know or at the very least suspect that Lightfoot means me no good, sneaking around at times, arrogantly parading his good looks, as he is apt to. He is sure to have laughed at me on the spot, or to have hounded me out, held me up for ridicule, or dragged me from this place and to the police. But who else? I cannot resolve it. I have to get back. And yet I hesitate, my courage lost. I settle myself on the ground a while. Light rain falls. I press down the soil here, then lift it again, and attempt to sift it through my fingers. I have to take hold of this distress or it will soon give me away. And all the <coughs> nourishment I have been in receipt of will count for nothing if I do not keep the body calm and allow it gently to tickle its way in and strengthen me. My mother would impress this on me in my youth, the need to take adequate time about things, and this so often with regard to eating, to sit and carefully digest so as not to upset nature's rhythms. And since this is an entirely new way for a human to take nourishment, then I imagine it calls for even greater care and attention. I am by now a far more complex prototype, or perhaps a simpler one, the planted man. Thank you. You have to forgive me, my new prescription didn't arrive in time, so I've been, I've been reading through glasses that I can't quite see through properly. Um, <laughs> but um, we're going to go downstairs in a, a few minutes and have a glass of wine if you have time to. And I have books for sale if you want them for yourselves or as Christmas gifts, mm -hmm. or if you have your own copies with you, um, I'm happy to sign them. But if you have any questions, mm -hmm. um, feel free to raise a small hand sure. or a large hand. <laughs> any questions? Maybe you can ask questions downstairs with Yeah, with a glass of wine yeah. in hand, yeah. would that be Please. easier? Mm -hmm. The yes. books are downstairs Lubricant. Uh, for you, uh, £8.99, so uh, if you are happy to, I'm, I'm going to buy one, definitely, but uh, it's all downstairs, so maybe we can just go downstairs and then start sure. enjoying a drink. Sure. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.